You have an exam to study for or a paper to write, but instead clicked on this video. Congratulations, you struggle with procrastination. But truth be told, I've struggled with it for most of my life. And it wasn't until university when I recognized the fact that procrastination isn't a personality trait, it's not who we are. It's a habit. Mel Robbins taught me that. Once we can identify triggers, once we can take actionable steps against it, the quicker we're able to return back to our work and get to the place that we want to be in life. I understand how tough it can be to procrastinate, so I really hope that you learn a lot from this video. You can take a lot away from it. My name is Jun Yu. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Man, I am super excited to do this one because if you were to do a survey for students all across the world and ask them, hey, what's the biggest issue that you encounter as a student? I would be very surprised if procrastination wasn't in the top five. So hopefully you can learn a lot from this. This is something that I've been able to apply in terms of a strategy to combat procrastination. It's become very powerful for me and I hope it can be just as powerful for you too. If you have any questions or any thoughts, please leave them in the comments below. If you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and then also of course subscribe. With that being said, sit back, relax and enjoy this video. Before we can even start talking about the solutions, we have to ask ourselves this really important question question of why do we even procrastinate in the first place? Because if we don't take the time to dissect and then accurately identify what the root cause is, then any solution we come up with will be inherently temporary, will be a band-aid approach. We don't want that. We want something more concrete. We want something a little bit more permanent, something we can rely on on a consistent basis. So let's just ask ourselves that question and break it down. Why do we procrastinate? And I actually think the answer might surprise you. You see, rarely is it because the task is overwhelming in and of itself. Instead, there are feelings associated with that task that we're actively avoiding. Perhaps you have a feeling of fear. You are a perfectionist and you've made progress on a piece, but you fail to return back to it because you're afraid of messing it up. I've been there. I know what that feels like. Or perhaps it's a feeling of guilt. You have a team that you made a promise to and you're late on that commitment. Now they're waiting on you. It's, it's hard to try and overcome that feeling of guilt. Or perhaps it's a feeling of just straight up embarrassment or shame because you've seen other people successfully accomplish this task and have made it look pretty darn easy. So you're wondering what's wrong with me? Why is it taking me so much longer? Whatever the feeling is, you have to understand that they're occurring not because of an event that's actually happened. Instead, it's a result of the thoughts in your head, the thoughts in your mind. But it's actually really difficult to distinguish between reality and imagination in real time. But the better we can understand why procrastination happens, the better off you'll be when you're trying to identify and take actual steps against it. We as human beings, we have this natural tendency to overthink. We do. You and me both, and everyone, I really do believe. Do some people have it harder than others? Yes. But we all, when we're introduced to a task, jump to the details, right? We start to think about when is the deadline? Who are the people we have to work with? What is it gonna require out of me? What do I have to sacrifice to get it done? We think about every little thing that can go wrong. And we start to create what I call artificial complexities or perceived complexities. They're not actually there, but they're in our imagination. But we all know that sometimes our thoughts can seemingly be our reality. What makes it worse is that we're usually introduced to a new task before we even get started on the first one. And then what happens is not only do you have these artificial complexities built for this first task, but now you have it for a second, and then a third, and then a fourth, and a fifth, and then a sixth. And then they all interact with each other and they compound and eventually they become this insurmountable mountain that you can't seemingly overcome. I've been there. And if you've ever felt the full extent of what procrastination can do to your mental health, you know how serious of a matter this is, right? You know that it can make you feel demotivated, it can make you feel lethargic, it can make you just feel like you don't wanna do anything. We don't wanna be there. And now that I've laid the foundation of how serious procrastination can be, let's jump into the solution. This is a three-step process in which I've utilized, I've applied, and it's worked tremendously well for me, so hopefully it can help you guys too. So the first step is to acknowledge the trigger. A lot of us, we procrastinate without even knowing that we're procrastinating. We don't have any awareness of it happening. And then eventually they just start to compile with one another. And then we just have these feelings of being completely exhausted and we're wondering what's wrong with us. We have to set time for ourselves on a daily basis to have that interaction and connection with that inner dialogue. And I talk about how important journaling is for me and I really hope that you guys are taking me up on that. But what's happening 
when you journal is you're writing your thoughts down and you start to create distance between you and your thoughts. Paper is more patient than people. There's that great quote. And basically paper is not gonna judge you. Paper won't make you feel stupid. It's not gonna call you lazy or that you're being irrational, right? As you're able to freely write down your thoughts, you can better reason with yourself. You can even think, oh my goodness, I don't even agree with that. But you wouldn't have known that if you didn't get it out of your head. And so once those thoughts are out, you start to go through the process of actively uncovering those layers and start to recognize, okay, this is what I'm feeling. And maybe this is why I'm feeling that way. So that's acknowledging your trigger. And then step number two is you apply techniques that reduce the initial friction point. You apply techniques that make it easier for you to just get started. Because once you do, you'll realize that that part was the hardest. The three techniques that I love to use, and I actually find myself using them quite often, are one, the five minute rule. Two, it's gonna be probably the most widely used productivity tip called the Pomodoro technique. And three, the three, two, one method. We're gonna quickly go over these one at a time. The first one being the five minute rule, which basically has you commit to just five minutes of work before deciding whether or not to continue. It's a lot easier for you to grasp working for five minutes versus five hours. But what happens during those five minutes? Well, I'll come to my desk and I'll open up the tabs that I need. I'll read the actual assignment prompt and now I know what to do. So what's gonna happen after those five minutes? I'm gonna think, okay, it's not that bad. Now that I've gotten the assignment up and I know exactly what's required of me, maybe I can get out my Word document and start a few paragraphs of the assignment. It's hard to start the momentum, but it's not as hard to sustain it. So now that I've created this positive momentum, then it's easier for me to stay in it because you enter what's called the flow state. That makes it a lot more natural, a lot more comfortable for you to do that work and you're able to work effectively. You see, after those first five minutes, it can quickly become 30 minutes. It can become an hour and eventually you'll have made significant progress. And even if you don't continue after the first five minutes, that's fine. Go ahead and do something else and then come back to apply the five minute rule again. Eventually, I bet you'll find yourself being able to surpass the first five minute bout. Actually, a quick little anecdote. I bought a timer off of Amazon. It was a sand timer. And for the first two years, it became an essential piece in my backpack. I would carry it around everywhere. And what I would do is whenever I would feel lethargic and not want to do anything and feel like I'm going to procrastinate, I would just flip that sand timer and look at it. And I'm like, I can commit to five minutes of work. Come on, June. I know you're tired, but five minutes, you can do five minutes. And I would do it. And then eventually I'd find myself going past the five minutes. I did this constantly, right? And actually the, the sand timer served two purposes. Not only did it allow me to apply the five minute rule, but it gave me a place to put my visual focus whenever I start to find myself being distracted. And so instead of looking out into the public space and seeing people and being distracted by movement, I would look and target my visual focus to that sand piece or particle dwindling down. And eventually that got boring, so I returned back to my work. Whether you use the sand timer or not, that's up to you. But the five minute rule in general is something that I certainly think you should apply. Number two, the Pomodoro technique. And if you haven't heard of this just yet, um, hopefully I can bring light to it because it is so powerful. And basically it has you work for Pomodoros, which are 25 minute intervals with five minute breaks. And then after a set of Pomodoros, you'll take a longer break of 30 to 45 minutes or even an hour break, right? Again, it's a lot easier for you to grasp the idea of working for 25 minutes versus three hours or four hours or five hours. But you'll find that each subsequent Pomodoro is much easier to achieve than the previous one, right? Because again, it's a lot easier for you to sustain that momentum than start it. So making that initial task a lot less daunting, the Pomodoro does a really good job of doing that. But also a, a, a caveat here, that 25 minute is just a suggestion, right? It's not something that you have to adhere to. I don't use 25 minutes, I use 45 minutes because for me, that's not that hard to do. 45 minutes doesn't seem so insurmountable. If it's hard for you to even get a few minutes in, probably 45 minutes isn't where you're gonna start. But 45 minutes still feels very easy to me and also allows me to take that break right about the time in which I'm gonna be bogged down by distractions. So just experiment with the time frame in which you wanna utilize for your Pomodoros and then find what works best for you and apply it. But again, the idea is can you find a time frame in which it's still seemingly feasible for yourself? It's 
like, duh, I can do that. Um, it's laughable almost. And then you'll find that each subsequent Pomodoros are gonna be easier for you to execute. Number three, the three, two, one method. This is a very simple yet powerful tool if it can become a subconscious habit of yours. Whenever you find yourself not wanting to do a task, count down from three and at one, immediately take action towards that step. Mel Robbins has that great quote that says, never let your mood dictate what you do. Always take action first because movement changes your mood. And it couldn't be further from the truth and I love that quote. And so what happens when we're making these decisions of pursuing our goals, our mind and our bodies actually enter this battle. It's our body saying, I wanna stay here. I wanna stay where I'm at. I wanna stay put. I wanna stay in my comfy bed. I wanna stay with my friends. And your mind is racing like, oh my goodness, we gotta do this and that. And we have these goals. We should go to the gym. We should go do our work. And actually, if you give yourself long enough, your body usually wins out. Um, your body keeps you where you're at. And that's why we tend to procrastinate on, on our work and tend to not wanna go to the gym. But the three, two, one method has you shift your focus to the counting. And then at one, you take that action. So you don't allow yourself enough time to start to create those artificial complexities or at least ponder upon those artificial complexities. And when you take action, you'll start to recognize that it's not not as hard as you originally thought that it was. So this has become absolutely essential for me in the mornings when I wake up. So literally when I wake up, I, I only ever set one alarm and that's because when I wake up, I do this. I, I roll over and I do three, two, one. And at one, I get up and I just start my morning routine. And usually that first action changes my mood and I'm able to continue sustaining that momentum into my first task of the day. Are there times in which I finish my morning routine and then I go back to sleep? Yes, I will be completely honest. But is that rare? Yes. And in general, more often than not, does the three, two, one method help me prevent that procrastination of getting the day started? Yes, and I think that's something that you should try implementing as well. So those are three techniques, but really any technique that helps you reduce that initial friction, that allows you to laugh at how easy it is to accomplish, the better off you'll be in terms of um, overcoming that level of procrastination. And then part number three, this is really important, and I think that this is the part in which most people don't do ever. And that is to recognize the success. Recognize the fact that you were able to overcome that procrastination. You see, we are our biggest critics. We are so quick to say, June, you are useless. You're lazy. You're unmotivated. You're good for nothing. But rarely do we say, June, you did a good job. Rarely do we compliment ourselves. Rarely do we give us that vote of confidence. And, and you see, like, we're constantly in conversation with ourselves. So if that's not a positive loop in your mind, of course it's gonna have an impact on you and, and how you go about what you do, right? So I take that time whenever you do to reflect, to say, I did this. I felt a certain way and I did not wanna do it, but I acknowledged the trigger. I took the actionable steps to overcome it. And man, did I do a good job? Because the more you're able to cement that as an actual task that you accomplished, that you actually took steps to overcome, the more likely you'll be doing that in the future. I have a perfect example of this. This happened to me yesterday. I had the longest day up yesterday. I had projects and I had exams. I had meetings for both my school projects and then also for my business. I had to go to the gym. There are so many things going on. I was getting so many messages constantly of people that needed my attention. And in my head, I was thinking, oh, how am I gonna do this? How am I going to try and even make any progress towards any of these? And I found myself doing that. I started to create these artificial complexities with each of those tasks and then they start to compile with one another and then became this insurmountable mountain seemingly where I was like, I'm just gonna call it a day, but I did it. I acknowledged the trigger, I wrote it down, and then number two, I implemented the five minute rule for the first two tasks, and then I gained that momentum to start, I was able to sustain it, and then before I went to bed, I made sure I took the time to think, I did that. Most people wouldn't have been able to do that. Most people wouldn't have been able to get through that day yesterday because they would have gave up. And I'm certainly somebody in the past that would have gave up, but I'm proud of myself for accomplishing that. You should be proud of yourself whenever you do accomplish something as dangerous, something as hard as procrastination. So that's part three. Never skip out on that, okay? You have to understand that you are powerful beyond measure. You are somebody that, that has a lot to offer. You're somebody that's very smart, That that can take somehow this seemingly 
crazy chaotic world that we live in and still be able to make progress on the days that you don't want to. Hopefully um, what you learned in this video was of value to you. Hopefully you learned a lot, right? So to, to recap, we first understood why procrastination happens in the first place that allows us to put ourselves in a better situation to distinguish between reality and imagination in real time. And then the actionable steps are number one, acknowledge the trigger. Number two, apply the techniques that reduce the initial friction and then make it easier for us to start. And then number three, acknowledge your success. Again, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. I'll be happy to answer. And of course, subscribe until next time. I hope that you take care. And of course, I'll see you at the top. Thank <laughs> you.